Hello, my name is Anand Bean and welcome to the 45th edition, the very, the very last in 2017 of Airhex TV. So let's start with the topics. So first, next week we have the, also the last airhex.com workshops in Munich. Um, the first, um, first workshop is absolutely uh, sold out and uh, we have a very few seats for for the remaining slots and the reason is the uh, the room is slightly smaller on the very first day uh, the problem is i have to fight with uh, bmw and od and all others you know to get the rooms not that easy um and there are uh, thankfully some registrations for uh, for the other workshops next year so um thank you and uh, what i can tell you java e is even more popular than ever so uh, thank you for uh, for coming. Now, uh, what also happened is um, I recorded a podcast with uh, a um, IBM Open Liberty developer uh, with Erin Schnabel, and uh, what was not mentioned in the podcast is uh, how I met her. And I think it was three or four years ago at Java One in San Francisco. And I evaluated the um, the Open Liberty um, web sphere and i tried to use java ee 7 or 6 profile and it just stuck so nothing happened and um, so i went to the ibm booth and asked her you know what's going on and she just looked two seconds on on the log file fire up uh, vi and just fixed this in second and since then since then we we chat uh, at conferences and because conferences are noisy and there is usually no time, you know, to uh, to exchange ideas because usually lots of interesting talks are going on. Um, I actually started a podcast and um, I take half an hour, one one hour, and or, or whatever it takes to um, to chat about um, technical topics. Okay. Workshops covered. So, what what else happened in uh, in this month? Um, I um, ex extended the uh, firehose. Um, I made the um, arrow, the exception handling, a little bit more user friendly, so you get uh, better better exceptions. And I tested a lot it with the Payara uh, fish. This is the um, <laughs> Payara fish, the Payara server. And uh, what I recorded here, how to use. Uh, Firehose together with um, use configure and use Firehose together with with Prometheus and Grafana. So um, I I um, gathered some metrics during during the screencast and um, and um, have some more ideas. What what you could do? What you can do with Firehose, for instance, you can also gather some business data uh, but this is more or less obvious i think harder it is to, you know to adapt to formats like json from uh from from glassfish um what also happened i uh i used uh, open liberty this is the web sphere liberty profile so the open liberty it was com is op completely open source and um, I recorded a podcast where I downloaded, extracted, configured, created a Java E project on Java 9 with Java 9 features and deployed that on Open Liberty. And I reconfigured Open Liberty in real time. So if you're interested, watch this. And I um, posted several examples about uh, Java E8. And the reason for that is next week we have one Java E8 in Java 9 day. And I wanted to practice a little bit. So I, uh, before I throw away the examples, I just posted them. Okay, so uh, this were, you know, this is the, how is this called, uh, month review. So what happened in my world. Um, what also interesting, so why this podcast take place, or podcast, uh, Airhex TV, uh, takes place uh, not on Monday, because on Monday I was invited to Hamburg user group. Um, to talk about Java 9 and Java 8. So they wanted to, to have the topic. I usually don't like just to talk Java 8 and Java 9 because, you know, um, if I just list all the features, it's just boring. But at the end, I just try to explain the possible use cases, what you could do with Java 8 uh, or the impact on Java 9 of Java 9, Java 8, and show some examples. It was nice conversation. And surprisingly, so uh, the my... How is this called? My, um, one of my clients, which is actually uh, Spiegel, uh, Spiegel Online, is like a German magazine, allowed me to talk about this. So we actually create together a microservice 
microservice architecture with one small team. Uh, I think they were even Java E beginners, but they really enjoy the lean way of Java E. And uh, they are actually hiring. So I get lots of questions. Do you know anyone you know uh, who, 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 who would like to hire developers for Java E uh, microservices? Yeah, they, 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 they hire some, some developers and uh, this nice little team, or little team, there's uh, several teams, but uh, it's, a, uh, it's a nice working environment, what I would again tell you from outside. Also funny, uh, I asked the uh, the um, the developers during during the Java user group meeting, you know, um, what about uh, the size of the war? And they told me it's five megs. It's like five megs. I mean, this is not no more a thin war. What do you did? And the next day in the morning, they came to me and said, okay, um, we had one Maven plugin, so we had to remove it, and there is a swagger inside, and we need some generated soap code because we talked to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, to another uh, service. So uh, and they, but by still they have the size to two and a half meg. Still a lot for Java, -E, but it is two and a half and not five. Okay. Brett Tucker, friend of the show and uh, and uh, attendee of ex.com, uh, uh, he comes from Utah, said uh, Merry Christmas. So Merry Christmas to you, Brett, and see you one day in Munich again, or uh, back to Munich. So this is why I'm late here in Java user group. Uh, it was caused by the Java user group Hamburg, and I think... Um, the uh, meeting was sold out in, uh, I forgot, a few hours. There were already 100 registrations and 100 on wait list. So Java E is crazy popular. That's what I can tell you. Okay. So uh, this was the reason. And now to your questions. So the first one, the first question. Uh, have you tried uh, Bean Shell? Yes, I did. And Bean Shell is fairly old. And uh, um, we use it back then for configuration. And how do you compare it to a groovy Scala or newly Kotlin? I would say uh, Binshell is older than all the others. And um, and but um, and there there was an attempt to standardize that, but it failed. So if you go there, let's see. So the um, the let's see what the results were. So it was uh, 12 years ago, it was rejected. And the results were what everything was green but it stopped so this is an interesting story actually so it's like uh, everything was successful but nothing happened okay can happen uh, and um, if you look at the examples this is very like much like a groovy and i would say not many developers know about bean shell nowadays so um, I would, if if you have the the problem, to you know of uh, of having a Java-like syntax and and would like to investigate something, I would choose something different. And having that said, uh, for instance, uh, so if you, if you if you look at the where was it intro? Yes. So uh, some of our features. This is the dynamic execution of the full Java syntax, Java code fragments, and so forth. And and I think we have something better than this. So um, we have a J shell, which is a Java nine tool, and it is it is even better. So um, I can actually say new date. Um, so uh, and then can just use it. So the variable is number one to string, and uh, so I can also say. Uh, date equals new date so i have the date huh symbol date date of course so and um and um what's also nice so if i just type in date So I get the Java doc included. So for investigations, so it's why if you if you hit tab twice, you get a Java doc expanded, which is one of the killer features in my eyes for J shell. So I would say I would prefer J shell, which comes with Java nine before I use Bean shell. So um, then uh, then the others, let's say, what was what was the question? So if you compare it to Groovy Scala or Newly Kotlin, so I would say. Groovy is very similar. I would prefer, gro prefer Groovy over Binshell because it's more popular. Scala, uh, yeah, uh, I don't like Scala because of the compilation times. 
and if you uh, if I just go to the source code of the libraries of Scala is really I I don't understand the code <laughs> so um, um, therefore I would I personally would prefer groovy and Kotlin is interesting so I get another question with Kotlin because Kotlin could kind of take off why because it's the official language for Android and Android is huge and therefore Kotlin comes with very good support in um, in IntelliJ so Kotlin if you if you have a reason just look at Kotlin um, Yes, Kotlin can be, of course, used in Java, Java application. The question is, of course, why you would like to do this? Because in my eyes, Java 8 and Java 9, they are perfect languages, very productive. And I don't think um, you are going to be a far more productive with Kotlin, Scala, Groovy, Bean Shell, J Shell, or whatever shell, uh, comparing to stock uh, Java 8. So, um, and if I have dynamic parts, if I would like to replace algorithms, I call that fluid logic in my book, I would use, prefer to use Nashorn, which is uh, ES6 and A or, or ES5, so JavaScript um, uh, interpreter, which runs in, in, in the JVM. So you can, uh, you can actually in the, look at the Firehose video, I'm using Nashorn there uh, to, to have uh, the ability to provide dynamic scripts which extracts the monitoring data so um, the problem here it seems like you are using Apache as a front-end for application server this is what I'm also doing so uh, if you go to my blog is actually Apache and behind the Apache there is uh, Tommy glassfish and whitefly so I um, uh, every application server the open liberty is lacking but I will fix that soon so uh, all known application servers a few years ago um, are delivering my blog with statistics and workshop registrations. Everything is Java, -y. and I don't have the problem here. What I'm using is mod JK. Mod JK is a binary protocol between the uh, Apache and the backend. What I think what you are using is the mod proxy. So, um, but but then uh, all all front ends I know you can set up uh, pass through I guess is the name so where the headers get a path through to the to the backend and if you search for Apache proxy pass exactly and headers uh, you will find the mod proxy uh, definition and um, and what you can even do you can even add new headers to that so I guess it should work um, I had, of course, I cannot just try that because uh, it will be uh, a huge under undertaking. And but I tried that, I think, with HA proxy, and uh, but uh, HA proxy is the, is uh, network level proxy, and with Nginx. So so I hope. I help you with that. So uh, look for the parameters. This one is interesting. Uh, I had similar similar problem here. So Monsieur A Front, and he's he was inspired by my videos. And what's interesting is if you if you read further, uh, this is a Spring developer uh, who likes uh, Java. E. This happens actually to me more and more during the Java user group meeting in Hamburg, for instance. There were some uh, Spring developers who asked me, you know, for instance, why they have to to manage all the Spring Boot dependencies, and my answer is, I don't know why you have to. I don't don't use it. And and there was a nice uh, nice uh, nice conversation afterwards if they saw how how Java E operates and and uh, how, how easy and lean it is. So and this is also one of the developers. So a front, if you can, I would be really curious uh, why you. Uh, going now the Java E route if you are a Spring developer. But what's unusual in Java E, I can tell you right now, is to create an abstract DAOs. Actually, most of my code reviews you have performed, if I find a DAO, is usually a, a defect. But um, I know where you're going with that. Uh, I wouldn't call it DAO or something else, but what you would like to have is a class like Entity Manager Switcher now. So this is actually what I also would do. So you have two Entity Managers, which are injected and now um, if you look at the code what what you try to do is depending on the id you would like to have uh, one of these um, uh, the um, entity managers active so what you could do for instance 
You could um, expose this ID as request scoped context or store the ID somewhere. And then what you could do is instead of doing this, get entity manager, you could say produces entity manager, inject the ID here. And depending on the ID returning this one or, or the another one, and then you could do here payment resource at inject entity manager and the and the right one would be injected um, either you know with the ID first of the of the ID second. I had to do something almost exactly the same. We had I think three or four entity managers, and in that particular case, what I did is I uh, injected several entity managers here and had uh, an unusual exactly this a switch case and uh, i think even i passed here parameter so it would be even even simpler so instead of exposing and relying on dependency injection you can pass the parameter here and you will get the first one or, or, or the next one so um this is this boolean ods you could pass here um or if you like you can inject the id here and make a dynamic dispatch and something like this it works and actually i um uh, is this to the right way it would work but uh in my eyes too complex so if you if you can you know implement a simple if else statement i would go with that why you know to use qualifiers and and whatever if just plain java works um i think hopefully let's uh so what what we have is the archive and CDI. Oh, it's the older one. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought this was a blog post, but it's actually a video. So you have to watch the video afterwards. Um, uh, I'm booting the um, the CDI container in a unit uh, in a in a unit test. And then I'm, I'm I'm selecting dynamically a bean, so I'm I'm making uh, I'm, I'm choosing a class and, and using the select. So if you watch this, how long it is? I don't know, five minutes or something. I did something similar here on the fly, um, just to show you, you know how to use uh, CDI outside the application server, and you could uh, do the same within the application server. So um. I wouldn't do this, it's too complicated. As I said, in your case, you have just two entity managers. So the question to you is, you only have two or you expect to have 100 later? If you expect to have more, this would be you no know, proper way. If you, uh, if you will only have two, period, I would just implement something like this, very simple. Even without the uh, DAO, you have something like, um, not abstract, like entity manager, provider and it can be injected then i say you know a method can uh, the name of the method could be em just em so uh, the shorter em and then you can just use the entity manager em dot and do something with it this would be my way um yeah and uh the, the whole DAO thing i this is not very Javaistic way of programming, I would say, because the entity manager is already, you know, a DAO on steroids and, and using another DAO to encapsulate the DAO is strange. So this is your, uh, what do you think about using Kotlin? Uh, wait a second, this Kotlin was already asked here, here Kotlin. So uh, you get the same answer, uh, Monsieur Omar. So uh, Kotlin in Java E project would work. The question is why? So what do you get out of that? Because there are far more Java developers than Kotlin developers. But uh, as I said, Kotlin's already interesting. By the way, if I would, uh, had a little bit more time and less projects and uh, would like to learn a new language. Now I'm really uh, completely overloaded with Java and JavaScript, I have to tell you. But I would sign you know, the, the capacity or, or you know, interest to, to, to learn a new language. I would actually learn something which does not run on JVM. So why to use something else which runs on JVM? If you would like to learn something new, just use do something completely new. This was also, uh, you know, 10 years ago, there was Ruby on Rails 2006, and there was also Grace with Groovy. So, okay, if I will find time, I will go, you know, the Ruby on Rails route. Why you should use Grails? Because uh, it's too familiar to me. So it's like, if I learn something new, then completely new. Therefore, I'm really happy with JavaScript, which runs in browser, so, uh, and uh, which is completely different environment in Java. 
and I learn the nodes the whole time and still forget all the things. So um, this is a great observation or interesting observation. So a small observation about conversation. So um, and he mentioned Dunning Kruger effect, and and uh, I said, okay, what is actually the 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 definition of Dunning Kruger effect? And the definition, uh, if you read it, this is a is a complicated uh, expression of uh, of uh, simple thing. It uh, so my understanding of Dunning Kruger effect is then someone overestimates its capabilities. So this is what how I understand that. Um, and the question is, you know, if someone. Uh, that someone just says because of Dunning Kruger effect, and this is does I, I I don't get it because if someone would have Dunning Kruger effect, it means it doesn't have any experience, uh, then uh, but believed he's a master, he probably wouldn't uh, wouldn't use Google stuff rather than implement everything from scratch. <laughs> Say okay, I, I'm you know the hero, and I would like to implement everything from scratch. So I think so regardless whether Dunning Kruger or not. Uh, Google uses it's so great. So exactly that I had all the time. Not only Google, Netflix, you know, uh, Hystrix on application servers. Everyone wanted to have Hystrix on the application servers, regardless that the application server had exactly the same functionality with circuit breakers, barkheads, and all the functionality. You say, okay, um, the the answer was uh, why? Uh, I mean. Netflix, you cannot compete w w with Netflix. And I'm saying, okay, but I'm not Netflix. So this is the main difference. Uh, you, are, you are not Google, you are not Netflix, and you probably don't have Google, Netflix, and Facebook's requirements. This is the big difference in projects. So what is good for Netflix or Google or Facebook is almost certainly not very good for smaller teams. So um, because Netflix rebuilds the full infrastructure from scratch, why I should rebuild everything from scratch if I am you now a two-man show or a five-man show or even a smaller enterprise project? In my eyes, it does not make any sense. So, and actually, this happens frequently to me even yesterday. So yesterday, someone asked me, like, you know, uh, we, we had to talk about um, configuration. So um, I, I showed, you know, with this, it produces a string. You can inject strings and, and fetch them from system env. And it was two liners. You can configure all the service from, from uh, within Docker, the cloud-like environment, and so forth. So then I say, okay, what is my opinion about Zookeeper? So I say, okay, I would never ever use Zookeeper just for configuration. Uh, and Zookeeper is more like the master slave. Uh, and I forgot that word. It's like a leader action. It's like, yes, leader elections, I guess. And then we discuss for about, I think, 15 minutes. And then uh, I would say, I would, um, for instance, if you really would like to have something different, I would use etcd or um, from HashiCorp, I forgot, Consul. And say, okay, but we use already uh, Zookeeper for leader election. So and this, of course, changes the whole discussion because in this particular case, if they already have Zookeeper for lead election, they can, of course, use Zookeeper as well for configuration. So this was the easiest possible choice. There is no need to discuss with me whether it is good or not. If it's already there, I would choose it first before I introduce another tool. And, and so my observation is there are lots of misunderstandings in, uh, in projects. And uh, we have to use this framework. Google uses it so great. So this is another symptom. It was like um, boring technology symptom. So what I observe more and more, uh, some uh, developers don't like the fact that Java is basically done. So if you if you just download the application server, you are productive in five minutes. So there is nothing else to investigate, to evaluate. You just go with the business logic. But if I would choose Hystrix, I have to integrate it with Java E, I have to integrate it with Tomcat Jetty, I have to do something. Um, so, and this doing something is a better feeling and is not so boring than thinking about the business logic. So, I, I, it's, it's funny, but I think really this is the, the main reason why I hear all the time about Google not so much, but uh, Netflix now is in and sometimes Facebook, so it really depends on the project. And uh, yeah. And by the way, then the then, then the uh, conversation started with uh, Angular, and uh, then I, we have no time to, to discuss this right now. But uh, in the project yesterday, we also have to, to discuss Angular, and uh, yeah. Your experience with deadlock conversation. My question is, uh, which requirements um, or 
How much is it better if we choose Google Framework over stock Java or Java? So this is how much time do we save? This is my main question. How much time do we save or what uh, or what part of the application makes easier? And uh, so did it happens all the time to me uh, in one project, for instance, uh, this is also recently, um, uh, a team created a proof of concept in two weeks. And actually what they had to show is a Java e microservice, which reads data from one single table, only one table from database. So this was the proof of concept and they created 45 classes. And my job was to review the code. So, I mean, I created, I think, 20 PowerPoint slides describing why it is wrong and just delete it, Julius delete it. And then I, I, I just say, okay, I, I can just write another 20 slides. Or my suggestion was I would fork the project and uh, provide, you know, an alternative. And there were about five classes already over-engineered over code. And no kidding, I spent more time arguing with the architect uh, why it is wrong to delete all the unneeded classes, which is, in my case, obvious, is even, you know, the principle of agile development, uh, test and delete waste. So, um, and, and we agreed that some classes could be deleted. And what I wanted to have to shorten the discussion, so I, in future point in time, let's say in three weeks, I would review the, your code again, but then at least we could delete, you know, all, all the unneeded code. And I don't know whether we agreed or not, but it was, uh, this is, so... This is, I try, you know, to get as fast as possible some numbers or, or, or something which is quantifiable, quantifiable or measurable. And, and this usually solves the problem. So let's see what happens here in the Twitter. Wow. Uh, so most of the clients build uh, on top of Spring. Yes, but it changes a little bit. Uh, I mean, lots of my clients, if you get, um, so let's say what usually happens, I'm involved in task forces and uh, after the task force, there's lessons learned and the lessons learned, uh, what we do, we throw away all the dependencies. Usually it's not uh, Spring involved. And I would say um, Sp Spring is fine outside Java E. So Spring Boot uh, is good comparison to Java E, but I wouldn't use Spring inside Java E. It's just too, too much overlap. Um, so two entity managers, so if you have just two entity managers, then go with simple if else statement and forget all the qualifiers and, and, and CDI magic, you know, use the entity manager, pass the ID and have an if else and you are set. So the GBU rand is available to get hired. So then go to Spiegel online and search for G G uh, the in the um, in the job. What I saw in the Java user group was not Java -E rather than J E position. So okay, uh, Victor asked me: Do JPA implementation Hibernate and so forth use JDBC internally? Absolutely. So they use JDBC. Do JPA implementation use an internal cache with then synchronize with DB later? absolutely is called unit or work they have multiple such cases and how it works is they while transactions are so great you can do whatever you like at the end of the transactions the entity manager computes or entity manager the entity manager implementation from hibernate for instance like the hibernate session computes the deltas and synchronize uh, creates from delta sql statements and sends them to a database by the way this is very similar to virtual dom in react or angular 456 or whatever version we have right now. Why do we need connection pools, DB connection application servers? Um, mainly before, uh, because if you just uh, use uh, straight uh, connections, local, uh, um, yeah, straight connections, <laughs> usual connections means no XA connections, just uh, transactional connections. And you have local transactions. What happens then is for each transactions, the connection is bound to the transaction. So you have, let's say, five parallel transactions. You get five parallel transact, uh, five parallel transactions. You get five parallel connections. So it wouldn't work with one connection, except uh, if you don't, uh, if you, if you're not working with uh, transactions, which would be, uh, which would be a little bit problematic, I would say, because of consistency. So therefore, usually what you will do is, if you have, uh, I know we talk about bulkheads, the thread pool of the applications of HTTP thread pool, if you have five threads, 
your uh, max pool size should be at least five or it should be five in the JDBC connection pool. And also what they do, application servers, they have prepared statement cache, which is uh, sometimes um, is, is uh, dependent or independent connections depends on database. And if you have a connection pool, so creating a connection, it means class for name, driver, driver manager, get connection, takes some time. And all the connections in the application server are already pre-initialized. So it is faster to reuse them. So this, this, these are the main reasons. Okay, so what's here? Nothing. Chat is quiet. The chat, I think, the last time, chat. Uh, th there were there were times where chat was uh, hyperactive, but now Twitter is more and more active, and the chat is almost dead. So I wonder why. Um, probably we should switch to something else. So, Henry. Luf, ask me, how do you decide the optimum Amazon AWS instance type and how you combine with Glassfish configuration for optimum performance? Um, I, I recorded actually a video on uh, how I push Glassfish to ECS uh, and I started, I hope, back then with a AWS and I'm using first the smallest possible instance, um, see what happens, uh, do a stress test and see how it behaves. And then what I also do, if client asks me, you know, um, uh, how how big the instance has to be, I ask them, you know, how big is the project and what budget do we have? If Because what you could do in Amazon with a little bit of uh, fiddling, you could use so-called spot instances. They are huge instances, but you have to leave them in... Um, in uh, a view, I think you have a few minutes time to leave them and they get killed. And um, what I did in my ECS, I just used, this is not Pico, but uh, it's called Mini, but uh, the, 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 the Pico instance, I think it was not uh, ac uh, not usable with ECS, it was not possible to get there. And the next instance is already good enough. So actually we did some project with the smallest possible instance. And uh, the evaluation is very similar to, to usual hardware. The question is, is it uh, CPU bound or IO bound? You have lots of uh, database uh, connectivity, um, uh, lots of database interactions, um, then you need more, usually more threads, but less CPU, lots of, lots of, uh, lots of uh, algorithms or encryption, then I would uh, give the server more CPUs and, and less threads. Okay, so it's basically no answer to, to uh, no answer, no difference to, uh, to bare metal or, or Docker. Um, so and usually, you know, if you have one or two cores, and uh, I would just so in the ECS, I think I, I picked 265 megabytes per instance, but I would go with two gigs. Why not? I mean, yeah. So um, another question: How do I upgrade a Glassfish application without losing cap availability? Actually, doing this right now. So using Payara, and I'm using um, OpenShift. And this is what HR Proxy does out of the box in OpenShift. You have rolling upgrade strategies. You can have uh, canary deployments. Everything is built in. So, and in all my microservice pro projects outside OpenShift, we use HR Proxy for that. You can also watch videos. So, if you go to my YouTube channel and search for HR Proxy or Nginx, there's how to use a load balancer with microservices in Docker. And uh, if you don't have Docker and you don't have, uh, you have nothing, just uh, you know, uh, museum technology with bare metal and Glassfish cluster, then still Glassfish was capable of rolling upgrades. If you search for them, this only works in Glassfish cluster. But this was uh, an extension built by a French team of developers and it worked well. Um, in clouds, we don't need clusters, we don't need admin servers, or we don't need uh, uh, cluster servers we only have uh, single instances okay so next one so it says thank you for all the good i should be you know very good so good is okay so good information you are providing means um uh, you know I'm, I'm i'm talking about something <laughs> just kidding so the question is um Mukli is playing with JWT authentication mechanism. So he wrote his own HTTP mechanism and has some trouble. And the trouble is uh, if the authentication does not work, he gets uh, web application exception, access local exception. Um, 
how to deal with that first. What you're not using here is the message context and message context is a method forward. So what you could do instead of doing this response unauthorized, you could you can just forward to error page and then or, or to for reauthorization. This is the obvious one. What you can also do, I think you get the exceptions because this thing is probably EGB or uh, uh, there is some EGB between. Um, and uh, what you can do, you can throw a web application or you can create your own application exception. Um, your own exception, which inherits from uh, not authorized web application exception if it exists. So let's see, does it exist? Uh, not authorized exception, exactly. So um, you would have to inherit from not authorized exception and annotate that with application exception. What happens then is then uh, your problem with the where is the EGB EGB access local exception to, uh, won't happen anymore. There will be no such thing, and the client will get 403, I guess. Uh, okay, so let's say my code. I think I hope it is uh, answered that. And what you can of course also do, you have the response here. You can redirect and 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 pass back JSON or or whatever you like. Let's say my I am. Um, code exposes REST API and has a GSF app and want and I want to use two different authentication mechanism. What is the best way to achieve that? Actually, what you can do, you can ask whether wait a second. What you can do there is um in the context there is credential and you can uh, and you can check whether this is user so um, how it would work you can um, you can create how it's called username and password credential or token credential and then uh, you can have multiple authentication mechanism and choose one on the fly and then you wouldn't uh, say context dot um, response unauthorized there's like context yeah do nothing uh, or not do, do nothing. There's a nothing like like uh, authorization skipped. So there are three options. So you have to say I skip the authorization. Then the next one kicks in, and uh, yeah, this is what you can could do. Okay. So now, very good question. Um, I even made a simple page app on web components and uh, even added routed uh, root capabilities. We did it actually in the, during the last uh, airhacks.com uh, workshops, I, uh, the, the attendees asked me now, and what if you would like to have router without frameworks? How hard is it? And we just implement that. I think there were four lines of code. Um, so, and very good point, but what happens if we need, you know, component like tables? And then what I usually do, you know, uh, just creating a table is not a big deal, but if the table needs filtering and all the crazy enterprise stuff, then of course, if you have React or Angular, it's always the same story, then you need an external component. And I would like to have a standard component. And therefore what I usually do, I point to to Vadin Elements. And Vadin Elements is a library of great uh, UI components um, and these UI components have uh, uh, are, are built on uh, web components as so just absolute standard. And uh, there is uh, there are lots of grids and tables, and the grids are actually great. So um, if you look at that, there is an HTML API. This is a web component uh, API, and you can use Vadin grid filter selection column. And this is really powerful components. Again, Vadin elements is not Vadin. It's just, you know, the JavaScript portion without the Java backend. So this is what I usually do. This is just one suggestion. There are multiple such frameworks. Okay. So, um, thank you for watching my Java Docker stuff. And I've better exactly, but I'm still not understand how you handle the database connection. Um, I actually forgot to to fire up my private cloud, so I will skip that. But for instance, if you are in OpenShift, so you can create your your uh, your service, and then what you can do, you can just choose a database, and and OpenShift comes, for instance, with Postgres, so it will install Postgres in your 
in your private cloud and you can access Postgres like it was a local database. Um, most of my clients have on-premise database. It's not dockerized, not in container, just on-premise. And this is not a huge deal because what happens then, your application runs uh, runs in your private cloud and the IP address and host has to be visible, of course, then you can just access us, access the database uh, directly. And what we do, if you have multiple database, in the uh, configuration of the application server, there's a placeholder and the placeholder is going to be replaced at startup. So it's supported by all the application servers, by Open Liberty, Tommy uh, and Glassfish, uh, Payara. Uh, Payara, and I'm not sure about Glassfish, but Payara does that. And um, and in the cloud, you will either have to buy at Amazon a cloud or uh, a cloud uh, database, or buy an AWS compute EC uh, compute instance. is just a, uh, a bare metal server, and then a volume. This is EBS el elastic block storage, and in, within the VM, you could install your database, or uh, you could just. Uh, there are lots of prepared images. So if you go to Amazon and, and, and browse the catalog, you get, you know, all the databases, so you can just run them. So this is not a big difference to non-cloud. Anyway, in, in my my eyes, there is there's really no huge difference be between running your apps, Java e apps in cloud and outside the, 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 the cloud. So, uh, uh, yeah. So this is better, Communist. Uh, no, congratulations to the good work. So I read great work. So again, good. Okay, thank you. Just kidding. And um, good question. Two databases and uh, how to synchronize them. So should I should I look uh, for a X8 transaction? It's a hard question because uh, I know projects where XA just works fine. So they had always never any problems um, a, the problem if you if you if you look at xa uh, you also will have to look at um, xa exception and the xa exception um, is thrown if something goes wrong and there are the several uh, states which such exception can have like uh, commit hazard mix means uh, one branch committed and rollback so in you will have to escalate the error some somehow and uh, if you just ignore the exception you cannot use uh, xa to face commit because your data gets lost and or get cor corrupted but if you have proper emergency management and you can react to all the error states then it could work but if you just if it's and this is Whitefly 8. This is why this, you got this answer because if this will be greenfield project, I would try to um, try to solve it uh, with uh, with the domain or or business use cases. So what you could do is to write to the first database, and if it fails, then decide you know what to do from the from the business perspective let's say the first database is an order database and the next one is payment so if i write the order and i cannot uh, cannot cannot fetch the payment what i what i what i would do i will create a counter uh, counter transaction and the counter transaction would be to cancel the order or cancel the shipment we cannot undo that anymore it would be like another use case on top of the already existing one so with two-phase commit what you're just doing uh, you, you could be lazier with two-phase commit if it works because you don't need the compensative transactions i talked uh, earlier so you can just rely that it works but um in most cases, it is very problematic. And also, I would only look at XA in case there are two exactly the same databases from the same vendor on the same patch level. Otherwise, it is almost sure that you will be in trouble under on the on heavy load. Also, two-phase commit, uh, it comes with some overhead, which is which is clear because there's um, far more communication going on behind the scenes. So how it works, the code. Oh, oh the next, the next one is, you're using Wildfly 8. What Wildfly 8 has to has to do, and this is Wildfly 8 cluster, I guess. Uh, the Wildfly 8 will write a transaction log, 
for two-phase commit. And this has to be persistent and reliable, so this is a file system. What it means is, if one cluster node fails, you will have to migrate the transaction log to another one. So what it basically means, there's a lots of moving parts, and if you get everything right, it could work, but you have still to react to the errors. But if, if, if it uh, goes south, there could be lots of troubles. So this is, and again, I saw lots of projects, you know, they were usually, you know, projects from the old days, host involved were people with lots of experience or where XA worked just fine. And um, and if you just do XA and forgot about this, this is almost usually you're asking for trouble. Okay, what's going on here? Nothing, nothing. And no questions here. So, and now to Monsieur Hönig. I got a question on Twitter, and uh, now I got the uh, his and and he asking me you now, what is the Java way to implement PWA? So now what he would like to have is have to have progressive web apps and single page applications built with Java, but they have to run in browser. This is the requirement right now. And by the way, what is wrong is Java VX ports to the browser. Oh, okay, I see. So it has to run in the browser because usually what I, you are right, is not wrong. What I usually would do, I would run Java VX outside the browser and never in browser. So which, um, and by the way, uh, there are interesting stuff here. J Suite um, is like cross compiler. So, uh, and the reason why I changed or, or what I suggested the last time is the following. You see the reason here. So uh, this is Java code, and this is the JavaScript code. But this is the ES5 code. This is the ECMAScript 5. If you would just look at the web standards training on some of my JavaScript videos, I could rewrite that almost identical to JavaScript, the new JavaScript. So the question is for all enterprise projects, and in enterprise project, we are in a unique situation. So unique situation means in most at least European companies, we are allowed to use Chrome or Firefox. So if you are allowed to use Chrome and Firefox, you get, you know, the newest tech uh, or the, the best possible support for for uh, HTML, yeah, HTML, DOM, JavaScript and CSS features. And then you can write almost Java code. So in fact, all most of my ES6 applications they look like Java X or or Afterburner apps. So this is and um, I showed them also to developers and they really like the approach. So for me, there is no need to create a transpiler or or just use Java if the modern JavaScript already looks like Java. I agree with you. I wouldn't like to write the old JavaScript ES5 like function exactly this. So uh, this is this is I don't like it. So and th therefore, in the past, yeah, I always I always try to find you know a Java solution for the web. And right now, I like the new JavaScript because for me it is almost identical to Java. So for me, there is no more rethinking. I just go to browser and I'm productive. And not only me, I get experience with uh, fresh projects which started without any frameworks with ES6 and JavaScript, and they are happy about that. So this is actually, this was a great, uh, but there are interesting tools you listed, like uh, J Suite and the, um, so I, I would not use JWT. So this is what I'm also very opinionated. This is like, uh, I would say uh, problematic technology. If you have lots of times compilation time, then uh, and you and you can drink a lot of coffee, then GWT is the right, <laughs> right choice. Um, yeah. And um, so I would, I wouldn't use TypeScript because uh, I have exactly the same attitude in the browser as in the backend. No dependencies. Use the platform rely on the standards and then we never ever have to migrate and my clients like it developers like it so we have similar mindset and typescript um, in if the project gets really huge so typescript has um and by the way uh, typescript was internally invented by microsoft because they had to port this uh, microsoft office uh, uh, how it's called 360 or something and there's a huge project of course in if you have such a big project it's a completely different requirement and i wouldn't use you know in my small single page app uh, typescript because i'm not microsoft so exactly the discussion from from before
Um, what's also interesting, you will like that, is called Duke Script. And Duke Script is really interesting. So the the Duke Script, I would call it, it is like um, HTML5 for Java, and uh, the NetBeans developer was also involved in Duke Script, and it it runs more or less Java in the browser with uh, with data binding, and this is actually the solution you're looking for. This this and uh, for native apps, there is Gluon uh, HQ, I think. And this is for mobile apps, and this is a similar approach. You can write with Java the uh, the, uh, the front end, and it gets you get a mobile app. But the cool story is you can inject uh, services running in a Java e server. And this is with uh, Johan Voss. Um, uh, this is a very good developer. He's a company from from Belgium. So um, I would look at this Gluon or Duke Script, and Duke Script uh, won um, Duke Awards. How it's called? Duke Choice Awards at Java One. Also, a very skilled developer from Munich, actually. This is um, Anton Apple, and they provide uh, training. And uh, I think he wrote even books. So it's a search for Ant Anton Apple Duke Script. You will find the resource. Yeah, and and this is a uh, this uh, Java Rockstar from Java One. So I think. I would look at that if you don't like you know, my way of providing just ES6 apps. So, isn't that kind of giving up Java? Uh, the problem is, um, it's not fault of Java. The problem are plugins in browser. So, uh, I think all the plugins will disappear. So, we have only one possibility. The possibility is to transpile Java to JavaScript right now. However, there is something completely different on the horizon, and you, you, we all can get our Java through Java in browser. So what it could be, or what it is, is called Web ASM. And this is Web Assembly, and this is, this is actually working already. And this Web Assembly, what it does is, this is like a bytecode Directly, directly executed, interpreted by the browsers, and um, and they are already and and this 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 is standardized. So all browsers um, will support it. This is high speed, uh, and um, and JavaScript will transpile or compile. I don't know, compile, yeah, exactly. JavaScript will compile to to a WebASM, and Java could compile as well. Um, so we could just take bytecode and compile it to this, and then we could get native Java, and this could be interesting. But still, I really like ES6. Um, and <laughs> we have the, uh, I do Java for 20 years like, like uh, right now, so I really enjoy to do something else, and I think it is suitable to focus just on JavaScript, because there, then, then you are covering the two most important languages uh, right now, I hope. Let's see, what was... Uh, TOB index, let's see. November. Oh, JavaScript is number six. This is impossible. And C sharp and Python. Okay, so I was wrong, but Java is number one. And it is a little bit less popular. So we have all learned C. But uh, actually, C knowledge could be could be interesting if you just would like to web assembly without Java. <laughs> just write the bytecode for the web. Okay, but still, JavaScript um, and uh, okay, Python and um, and uh, yeah, what I'm doing JavaScript and Java right now, and uh, really happy with it. I hope I answer the questions. Um, yeah. And offline functionality is actually not a problem because uh, service workers are uh, can count access to the cache, and this is just an API. So I could call it from 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 ES6 or later Java. The Java world has answer to this. The answer to this is not run in browser. Right now, the native language in the browser is JavaScript. Period. And um, and by the way, with Duke Script and Gluon, or Gluon not with Duke Script, you get the PWA, but uh, still, uh, PWT was heavy offline functionality. What it will mean? Um, let's see. Do we have Java Web ASM? Compiler. Oh. 
Okay. Just 21 stars, no idea how popular it is, eight months ago. So it seems like we are able to, so this is a preview, to, to cross-compile Java to, uh, to WebAssembly. And um, yeah, so something happens. I hope this was the answer. And the Java answer would be to run JavaFX uh, outside the browser, which is perfectly viable solution. Okay, let's see what happens here. Now, very good. You see the first one. For all my wonderful work, so it's no more good. So this is uh, it gets better and better. So the problem here is the following. So uh, balance request does something and goes to the outside service. Seems like, and this is supplier of requests of response and supply async balance request supplier and the inquiry is probably the thread pool and the problem is here that the handle uh, handles the exception and then if you handle the exception you're probably returning response and then you're accepting what happened here so what you can do this response accepts the result and object, or it also accepts uh, accepts the response. So um, you can do both. And there is note on the handle you can uh, you can look at uh, exceptionally and on complete. So what you can do you can also call then apply and convert the response to something else. So I think the problem you have here is that this is supplier of response and in the handle response you are handling the exception here and then you're just passing back the uh, the response and by the way I would never block here because if you block here this does not make any sense. So the whole idea is not to block here and then you're not blocking the method. And uh, Java EE microservices. I'm not sure whether I did something on YouTube, but at least here in my. So we have completable future and exception handling. Um, and I think I I wrote a unit tests with all the with all the uh, possibilities of exception handling. And um, you don't even have to buy the course to look it up because it is free on github the source code you only have to find it <laughs> this is now your task uh, somewhere here i have here the um uh so the whole the whole code is here so take a look at that and uh yeah if not see you in january <laughs> um it's um three four weeks i think is yeah shorter because we are late okay now let's see I hope I could help you so this is uh, so Naradin asked me I'm trying to encrypt from data use an email password for, before sending to browser don't do this you cannot encrypt this so usually you have to use HTTPS and by the way what you should do this is the servlet spec and what you have to search is uh, is the logging um, form authentication and it looks like this and then it is sent to the server this is standard java e way and um, what you have to do is you have to set up in webxml confidential so just take a look at this and if you set this as uh, confidential it just uh, works over ssl and then everything is encrypted so um, if you have a form just look at that this is the um, Login authentication. I just have servlet four, but this is the, didn't change. In this is in all the uh, servlet specification. And take a look at the authentication. And you see here, this is you can use the basic digest. I would never use the digest. So take a look at the basic, at the form based um, or HTTPS client authentication. This is what you can you can do, and the additional methods are described as well. But this would be my approach uh, to your problem. Never ever try to encrypt anything uh, directly in the browser. 
Ah, I met this nice developer yesterday. It was yesterday, you know, a day before at the Java as a group. And the, his question was how to convert local date time uh, with JSON B in Java 8 uh, to, uh, to, from Poja to JSON and back. And the cool story is, um, I, um, I look at this, and there's no problem. It works out of the box, even with custom formats. You can you can even specify format how and what you would like to to do. And what I also promised to write a blog post, and I will try to do it tomorrow or next week or a week later. But uh, the the good news are, is, if you use local date time or just local date in a Pojo and you use JSON B, it will serialize back and forth this into JSON in the standard format and you can choose the format with uh, I think it's called JSON B date mapping and you can provide the format so so uh, something new uh, or interesting there is a JAX WS which is the SOAP and OneFly 10.1 which is a fairly recent file, uh, white fly and it gets a EGB transaction rolled back uh, because of timeout it looks like and the problem is everything gets rolled back uh, what what and the, the, what is actually the question so however I believe there has to be a way to make the connection timeout exception roll back the current when the was probably I read this and forgot actually what the problem is so um yeah. So first, what you can do, you can you can increase the the timeout, which is usually five minutes. I think is the standard. If so, if if you are to hit the five minutes, you should really roll back because five minutes is way too long. And um, mm -hmm. so you you should increase the timeout. What you can also do, if you inject the session context, you can you can ask the session context whether whether the um, the uh, the transaction is going to be rollbacked. So there's a method set now get rollback only, or is or I think is not is rollback only rather than get rollback only. So search for session context dot is rollback only. So you will see in all other methods whether the transaction is going to be rollback or not. And what we are doing here is you are marking the other methods requires news so that they just complete. So it looks like. You have an outer method which takes too long, and this outer method invokes inner methods which uh, which uh, are shorter. And if you mark them as requires new, you can complete the. You have multiple independent transactions, which is a little bit dangerous for consistency. So what do you, how how to deal with the problem? Um, what you can. Yeah, the problem you have is the uh, transaction timeout happens outside because it is caused by the JTA, so you cannot catch it easily. So you have really increased the the timeout. This is global setting on the application server to 10 minutes, whatever suits you, and then it won't happen anymore. Um, what you could also do is to inject user transaction and if you inject user transaction, is actually terrible. So first, you, you will have to mark the EGB uh, transaction management bean. Then inject user transaction. Then uh, begin and commit the transaction, so it's the, uh, the problematic transaction. And then what you can do, you can say set transaction timeout and specify your timeout. This would be also a solution to your problem. And then you can catch whatever problem you have inside the code. I actually never used user transactions in my projects, but always as a workaround. So once we had a problem with, uh, I don't know, with a tool, and we have to use it, but never because of business logic. Okay. Wow. Lots of new stuff. Um, The question if you want to behave with the java 9 methods have what might be the alternative for java 8 so what he does is we have or timeout so this is uh described in my blog and get okay so i don't get the so the or timeout means that the um the full pipeline times out if you have jax rs for instance 
you can uh, you can say uh, async response set timeout and then you get uh, what happens at least is you get the timeout to the client so this is the first thing you can do so because if you we use java 9 and java ee8 with java 8 we could set up two timeouts right one's for the async response and the other one with completable future and uh so this is what we can do in java 8 on java 7 or java 8 async response set timeout and set timeout handler this works right now out of the box but if you would like to have the timeout inside the pipeline so then supply so what do you what do you uh what do you have to do then to specify the timeout within the methods and this could work with transaction timeout for instance and if you are working with singletons there is an access timeout or if you are dealing with databases there is a connection timeout so you have to and if and if you're calling let's say completable future then what's called uh, supply async and you calling an external service then you i would provide the hdp timeout there so uh this is how it would work because this um, java 9 solution to the problem is only if there is no fine-grained timeouts uh, so i have a global timeout which is i mean yeah this is uh how it's called the last line of defense how do you choose the type of database in your project relational database versus document database or no no key value stores i mean if you look at the data, this is the answer, right? And and what what, what I can answer you is is the following: what kills relational database is the is uh, the fact that if you if you run your DDL data definition language changes uh, with um, liquid base or, or flyaway DB, and it takes more than few minutes, it will kill the relational database because it means basically your application gets offline for this amount of time and this kills usually relational database in my projects and we look for alternatives so on how to choose them uh, i would say there's always trade-off and the trade-off is relational database are type safe and the problem is if you are not uh, very disciplined with good ddls it they will the quality will degrade to more or less key value pairs with back references and this is terrible so you get you know no type safety and uh and ugly queries um document databases or nosql databases you don't have to change the ddl so the the, the 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 schemas so what you what you what you can do you can uh you can provide a broader and broader objects or you can um and and the and your business logic logic have, have has to deal with uh with the changes or with uh, with a different uh how it's called different types of objects at the same time so what it means is if you have for instance a huh, a device in the uh, in that in a table or in a document so newer versions of the device can have more sensors than the old one for instance right and your business logic have to deal with that so thank you for for following me and go to the next one so i didn't read this because it's everything from today so i got oh man. crazy so this is the last uh, last minute question so let's see what happens here um what is your preferred way for connecting a desktop application eclipse rcp oh I, I i hoped it was not your choice this eclipse rcp you just have to use it so to backend server rest we use Java VIX projects, AWT Swing, even uh, no AWT uh, Swing, and uh, we used uh, always REST. Remote is not a thing. Forget it. Uh, REST, uh, no WSDL. Okay, on on SOAP, I wouldn't also use SOAP anymore. So, several Java and Microsoft are running in different containers. Four services or eight or even 16 um would provide standard information like current internal status and can I, okay over a status application maybe a single app which shows the status of running provides action call known 
Take a look at Firehose, I would say. And how how would you technically implement to register myself microservice to a status app? So I did something like that, and I use WebSockets. So um, uh, all application has to know there is a standard monitoring tool like Watchdog, and they just push per WebSockets and say I'm here, or I don't know even know is a WebSockets or Chuxres, and which are online. Um, Go to my YouTube channel if you have a, this is microservices in a different container. So what it means is you are running Docker and in Docker you have uh, health checks. So usually you, Docker does it for you. And if you go to Docker PS, you will see what is healthy or not. It happens out of the box. Um, in OpenShift, there's liveness and readiness checks and Kubernetes as well. So if you have Kubernetes, it's also a solved problem. So usually you don't have to do it by yourself. So it is solved by Kubernetes, it's solved by Docker. And um, look at Firehose, you have a central facade and Firehose could, could go to all your microservices, gather the metrics. And if one microservice does not answer, then uh, it's not there. So you always you see that. And what we also do in one project, uh, the Kubernetes and OpenShift, they have a REST API. So or, so a service can ask, you know, via REST, how many pods are running. So, okay, just to questions left. So this will be one of the longest shows ever, I think. So um, they recently find me. Okay. we They have Java, JSF and Java 7 running on Payara. When the session expires, there is a session something uh, expiration listener. It is an HTTP. Uh, um, it is on server level. You get that. So, um, and what could also work, you could have a session scoped a CDI bean, and there is a pre, pre destroy, pre destroy. You can also have this callback. So you get this, and there is HTTP session binding listener, is the name. HTTP session binding, binding listener. Right. So, value bound, value unbound. Oh. This is something else. This is these. Uh, what is bound and unbound? And there's also uh, session. Was, let's see. Uh, Java AE session expiration. It's not the name. Something else. This is. Yeah. Session listener just. Session created and session destroyed. Okay. So, what is your opinion on using uh, Vertex instead of Java for a microservices-based application? So, you saw my code. We use it in production, and I have to tell to tell the following: Java E is like you know, basic, boring technology, which most of developers know, and they're happy with it. So, if my clients are happy and everyone is productive, we don't look to something else. Having that said, Vertex is interesting. So if I would have uh, problems with comes from Red Hat, it's interesting. I know some really uh, very good developers who are using Vertex. So uh, yeah, do you think it's a worthy alternative compared to Java E? So what it means worthy? So um, let's say uh, the, I don't think any of my microservices projects in this year could be implemented faster or we could save any money with a different technology i don't think so i would say with node.js we would even lose money <laughs> but comparing to other technologies um, we would be as fast as java e probably the cool story with java e uh, the stack overflow factor so if i go to stack overflow and have a question the question is no which technology provides me the most answers? And I think Java e. So you get to know if you have question, I'm running on Whitefly, don't even mention microservices. And I have this and this problem. Um, you know, you get the, I, I hope uh, most, no, I hope I know most answers on uh, for, because it's Java is all technology. More scalable. So Vertex seems to be more scalable. So what I can tell you, a single 
application server, empty application server, like Hello World app, you can achieve 10,000 transactions per second. So if, you're, uh, if your application is CPU bound, you can linearly scale. If it's an I.O. bound database, whatever you're using in your container or microservice, you will still have wait for the database. So the question is now, what do you mean, what, what do you would try to build first? So if you are building Facebook-like stuff, then I would look uh, for um, something else like Java E because if you have you know, hundreds of thousands of microservices, then it is worth for optimization. But if you are building, if you are planning to build an enterprise app with you know, f five to 10 nodes in cluster or the cluster like there's no more cluster like working in parallel, then uh, Java E was just fine. And, and by the way, all my startups were amazed how fast Java E actually is. And uh, was able to reach double the throughput of Java and use less resources. Uh, this would be interesting. What you actually did? I mean, what do you mean that you have with Vertex twenty thousand transactions per second? And if you really have the question is really this is, it really depends on con uh, on the con on, on context. What can happen? I don't know what you are building. If you have, for instance, like message-based, you know, message passing application, then uh, yeah, then you should probably use JMS or whatever. Then also changes completely. But this is what I will in investigate. Wow, this is a kind of test. So, uh, Glassfish three is ancient. And core by util means you're probably using uh, remote EGBs, and uh, and you have a deadlock. What it could be, everything. <laughs> but uh, what's unusual here that this is uh, Korba stuff, and Korba means usually, I would uh, I would guess remote EGBs. This is uh, RMI over IIOP, and. Uh, possible solution would be to look at the remote interfaces and uh, yeah okay I hope no questions left we are one of the longest show thank you for watching and see you in 2018 so prepare your questions and uh, it was I really enjoyed the show I don't know why it's like uh, almost like a Java -y community or community yeah I get afterwards uh, lots of feedback. So thank you for watching. See you probably next week um, in, in Munich or next year at EHX TV. So thank you and bye.